On September 12, 1954, Meher Baba gave his darshan, or personal blessing, to about 75,000 people in Ahmednagar, India. On this day, Meher Baba issued his call. His words were read out on his behalf, and they continue to ring with profound significance for all of us in this time. I knew him and loved him as the Christ. As he arrived, he spelled out on the alphabet board, which he used to communicate verbally, not as man to man, but as God to God, I bow down to you so as to save you the trouble of bowing down to me. Again, Baba's words were read out to the people over the loudspeakers. He said, to make you all share my feeling of being one with you and one of you, I sit down beside you. Returning to the platform, he washed the feet of seven poor men, after which he gave each a gift of 51 rupees, saying, as each one of you is in one way or another an incarnation of God, I feel happy to bow down to you and to lay at your feet this Devdakshana gift offered to a deity. came more or less as a surprise, probably not only to me, but to the other Westerners. We just arrived the previous night. We had no idea of what we were going to be experiencing the following day, only that we looked forward to seeing Baba, of course. And Baba was uh, very beautiful and very, very powerful as he came up on the platform. And he just gave us a glance, a quick glance, you know, just to acknowledge our presence there. So many who came before him brought beautiful, sweet-smelling garlands of flowers. So the atmosphere was surcharged with that fragrance of mostly the jasmine, sweet-smelling jasmine flowers. These people were from all walks of life and from every religious background that you could imagine. Well, probably some of them really thought of him as being the avatar. Maybe some thought of him as being an incarnation of Vishnu or Krishna. Many also probably thought of him as being a great saint or just a holy man whose contact they'd like to have. In my case, I had always thought of him as the Christ, and I saw him there as the Christ at work with the multitudes. And it was a day of divine love and action. As I watched, Hour after hour, my great wonder deepened into amazement, and I suppose even astonishment. I realized that something far more significant than was visible on the surface was actually taking place there. I was impelled to try to fathom that significance. I have come to the conclusion within my own mind that Baba was not only working with the thousands that were there at that time, but that he was doing a universal work. I felt that his love was going out throughout the whole universe, that he was doing a universal work there at that time. Following some speeches, the darshan program began, and this amounted to Baba really going to work. He took off his coat, rolled up his sleeves, 
there were so many that in order for them all to have a contact, they had to move very rapidly. To each one, Baba would give a handful of sweetmeats, but more than that, he gave each one a personal contact. It was a love exchange, a love gift, really, from him. Of course, the significance was divine love. And I've always felt, since being with Baba, that divine love is total significance. Although, as a vital part of his mission in the world, he had remained silent since 1925, he gave out many messages and even dictated several books. Here, then, is the message, Meher Baba's call, as dictated by him in English. Age after age, when the wick of righteousness burns low, the avatar comes yet once again to rekindle the torch of love and truth. Age after age, amidst the clamor of disruptions, wars, fear, and chaos, rings the avatar's call, come all unto me. Although because of the veil of illusion, this call of the ancient one may appear as a voice in the wilderness, its echo and re-echo nevertheless pervades through time and space to rouse at first a few and eventually millions from their deep slumber of ignorance. And in the midst of illusion, as the voice behind all voices, it awakens humanity to bear witness to the manifestation of God amidst mankind. The time is come, I repeat, the call, and bid all come unto me. This time-honored call of mine thrills the hearts of those who have patiently endured all in their love for God, loving God only for love of God. There are those who fear and shudder at its reverberations and would flee or resist, and there are yet others who, baffled, fail to understand why the highest of the high, who is all-sufficient, need necessarily give this call to humanity. Irrespective of doubts and convictions, and for the infinite love I bear for one and all, I continue to come as the avatar to be judged time and again by humanity in its ignorance, in order to help man distinguish the real from the falls. Baba interrupted the program to go to a nearby field where there were some 20,000 poor people being given a free meal. In their devotion to Baba, they would not even start eating their meal until Baba came and shared a little of it with them. This was the only actual break that I saw him make all day. loses one's oneself in an experience like that. Just become lost in it. Really overwhelmed by it, I might add. <laughs> At least I did. schedule was for Baba to leave at 6 p.m. But still, there were so many pressing forward to see him and have a contact with him that he climbed up on top of the car. Baba's love radiance lent a special kind of glow to the, the whole atmosphere. One did not remain static and crystallized as one ordinarily was being around Baba. There was always some kind of a dissolving process that took place. And on this occasion, it was, uh, it was really gigantic. It uh, was devastating to the, <laughs> the uh, hard shell of the personality self, you know, the crystallized self. When that begins to dissolve, something else can happen within. And one is able to experience love at a much greater intensity than ordinarily, and actually to express, to feel that love. Even after Baba left, 
people were coming by the thousands until late at night. And of course, they did not get to see Bamba that day. So he arranged to have another darshan program on the 26th of September 1954 near the uh, trust's office in that compound. And people came forward the same as they had at the big mass darshan, had their intimate contact with him, their love contact with him. From a Western point of view, their devotional way of expressing themselves was much more impressive than uh, in the West. You'd think people would come forward and shake hands, but in India, they want to come forward and put their head at the master's feet, kiss his feet, do things like that, you know. The sense of appreciation seemed much more intense. To continue with Baba's words from the call, invariably muffled in the cloak of the infinitely true humility of the Ancient One, the divine call is at first little heeded until in its infinite strength it spreads in volume to reverberate and keep on reverberating in countless hearts as the voice of reality. Strength begets humility, whereas modesty bespeaks weakness. Only he who is truly great can be really humble. When, in the firm knowledge of it, a man admits his true greatness, it is in itself an expression of humility. He accepts his greatness as most natural and is expressing merely what he is just as a man would not hesitate to admit to himself and others the fact of his being man. For a truly great man who knows himself to be truly great, to deny his greatness would be to belittle what he indubitably is. For whereas modesty is the basis of guise, true greatness is free from camouflage. On the other hand, when a man expresses a greatness he knows or feels he does not possess, he is the greatest hypocrite. Honest is the man who is not great and knowing and feeling this, firmly and frankly states that he is not great. There are more than a few who are not great, yet assume a humility in the genuine belief of their own worth. Through words and actions, they express repeatedly their humbleness, professing to be servants of humanity. True humility is not acquired by merely donning a garb of humility. True humility spontaneously and continually emanates from the strength of the truly great. Voicing one's humbleness does not make one humble. For all that a parrot may utter I am a man, it does not make it so. Better the absence of greatness than the establishing of a false greatness by assumed humility. Not only do these efforts at humility on man's part not express strength, they are, on the contrary, expressions of modesty born of weakness, which springs from a lack of knowledge of the truth of reality. Beware of modesty. Modesty under the cloak of humility invariably leads one into the clutches of self-deception. Modesty breeds egoism and man eventually succumbs to pride through assumed humility. The greatest greatness and the greatest humility go hand in hand naturally and without effort. When the greatest of all says, I am the greatest, it is but a spontaneous expression of an infallible truth. The strength of his greatness lies not in raising the dead, but in his great humiliation when he allows himself 
to be ridiculed, persecuted, and crucified at the hands of those who are weak in flesh and spirit. Throughout the ages, humanity has failed to fathom the true depth of the humility underlying the greatness of the Avatar, gauging his divinity by its acquired limited religious standards. Even real saints and sages who have some knowledge of the truth have failed to understand the Avatar's greatness when faced with his real humility. Age after age, history repeats itself when men and women, in their ignorance, limitations, and pride, sit in judgment over the God-incarnated man who declares his godhood and condemn him for uttering the truths they cannot understand. He is indifferent to abuse and persecution, for in his true compassion he understands. In his continual experience of reality he knows, and in his infinite mercy he forgives. God is all. God knows all, and God does all. When the Avatar proclaims he is the Ancient One, it is God who proclaims his manifestation on Earth. When man utters for or against the Avatarhood, it is God who speaks through him. It is God alone who declares himself through the Avatar and mankind. I tell you all, with my divine authority that you and I are not we, but one. You unconsciously feel my avatarhood within you. I consciously feel in you what each of you feel. Thus, every one of us is avatar in the sense that everyone and everything is everyone and everything at the same time and for all time. The Big Mass Darshan program was really only the beginning of what was later described as three incredible weeks with Mayor Baba. There were many other days which uh, seemed equally incredible, just incredible. It was so wonderful being with him. Coming to India was uh, the culmination of many years of longing and uh, inner striving to be near to him. Being in his presence day after day brings about a radical change in one's inner being. Baba himself is unlimited, infinite consciousness. He is unlimited light, unlimited truth, unlimited reality, unlimited love, the ocean of divine love. Simply being in his presence, we were exposed to these very truths, this very reality, enveloping and permeating and just filling us with, with uh, well, mostly his divine love. Baba goes on to say in the call, there is nothing but God. He is the only reality, and we all are one in the indivisible oneness of this absolute reality. When the one who has realized God says, I am God, you are God, and we are all one, and also awakens this feeling of oneness in his illusion-bound selves, then the question of the lowly and the great, the poor and the rich, the humble and the modest, the good and the bad, simply vanishes. It is his false awareness of duality that misleads man into making illusory distinctions and filing them into separate categories. I repeat and emphasize that in my continual and eternal experience of reality, no difference exists between the worldly rich and the poor, 
But if ever such a question of difference between opulence and poverty were to exist for me, I would deem him really poor who, possessing worldly riches, possesses not the wealth of love for God. And I would know him truly rich, who, owning nothing, possesses the priceless treasure of his love for God. His is the poverty that kings could envy and that makes even the king of kings his slave. So many times I have thought about you in the darkness of my room all alone. And now it seems that all of my thoughts of you, it seems that somehow they have grown. For you mean so much more to me, so much more than I had ever known. For you're all that is in life. Yes, you're all that is in life. You're all that is in life. Spirit, it lies inside of me, and it runs through the blood in my veins. I guess that's why all that I know in my life, it's that I will see you again. Well, if you're in me, well, if I'm in you, then for everything it must be the same. Then you're all that is in life. Then you're all that Know, therefore, that in the eyes of God, the only difference between the rich and the poor is not of wealth and poverty, but in the degrees of intensity and sincerity in the longing for God. On the 29th and 30th of September, we Westerners were privileged to attend an important meeting at Meherabad, during which Baba gave his final declaration. As the meeting began, Baba greeted each one with an embrace. Again, from the message Meher Baba's call, love for God alone can annihilate the falsity of the limited ego, the basis of life ephemeral. It alone can make one realize the reality of one's unlimited ego, the basis of eternal existence. The divine ego as the basis of eternal existence continually expresses itself, but shrouded in the veil of ignorance man misconstrues his indivisible ego and experiences and expresses it as the limited, separate ego. Pay heed when I say with my divine authority that the oneness of reality is so uncompromisingly unlimited and all-pervading that not only we are one, but even this collective term of we has no place in the infinite, indivisible oneness. Awaken from your ignorance and try at least to understand that in the uncompromisingly indivisible oneness, not only is the avatar God, but also the ant and the sparrow, just as one and all of you are nothing but God. The only apparent difference is in the states of consciousness. The avatar knows that that which is a sparrow is not a sparrow, whereas the sparrow does not realize this and being ignorant of its ignorance identifies itself as a sparrow. Live not in ignorance. Do not waste your precious lifespan in differentiating and judging your fellow men, but learn to long for the love of God even in the midst of your worldly activities, live only to find and realize your true identity with your beloved God. Be pure and simple and love all because all are one. Live a sincere life 
Be natural and be honest with yourself. Honesty will guard you against false modesty and will give you the strength of true humility. We have waited all our lifetime for the truest of our friends. For the truest of our lovers. One who will love us to the end. Now at last it seems we've found you. Before us all you stand. As we bring ourselves around you. We all reach out for the hand of someone like you. Always knew someone like you, we've all been waiting for forever since you come to everyone. Now we all will wait no more. Spare no pains to help others, seek no other reward than the gift of divine love. Yearn for this gift sincerely and intensely, and I promise in the name of my divine honesty that I will give you much more than you yearn for. Over the years, Meher Baba's close companion, Erich Jesuwala, was the one who most often spoke out Baba's words at public gatherings. Unity in the midst of diversity can be made to be felt only by touching the very core of the heart. That is the work for which I have come. I have come to sow the seed of love in your hearts so that in spite of all superficial diversity which your life in illusion must experience and endure, the feeling of oneness, true love, is brought about amongst all nations, creeds, sects, and castes of the world. Through the years, we will all find, and in time, we'll all be calm. Someone like you, we always knew. Someone like you, we've all been waiting for. On the 30th of September, he led the whole company up the hill at Meherabad, and we gathered with him near what was later to become his tomb shrine. We'll wait no more for someone like you. We always knew someone like you we've all been waiting for. This is the ideal way through the personal aspect of God to discover the, the unlimited, the unlimited nature of divine love, which uh, eliminates separation of all kinds and gives one a sense of oneness. He explained to us in India that he is really always with everyone. But for the most part, people are so preoccupied with other things that they're not conscious of it so that they have to be working on becoming conscious of his presence and to value that presence rather than all the other things which distract the mind and the heart, you see. Miss Kitty Davy met Meher Baba in London in 1931. He stayed in her family's house on his first visit to the West. These words from Baba were also read out during that incredible mass darshan program. To love God in the most practical way is to love our fellow beings. If we feel for others in the same way as we feel for our own dear ones, we love God. If instead of seeing faults in others, 
we look within ourselves, we are loving God. If instead of robbing others to help ourselves, we rob ourselves to help others, we are loving God. If we suffer in the suffering of others and feel happy in the happiness of others, we are loving God. If instead of worrying over our own misfortunes, we think of ourselves more fortunate than many, many others, we are loving God. If we endure our lot with patience and contentment, accepting it as his will, we are loving God. If we understand and feel that the greatest act of devotion and worship to God is not to hurt or harm any of his beings, we are loving God. To love God as he ought to be loved, we must live for God and die for God, knowing that the goal of life is to love God and find him as our own self. Amari Meher Baba's call, Baba said, I give you all my blessing, that the spark of my divine love may implant in your hearts the deep longing for love of God. Thank you. 